Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, episode 71. Today, we're going to be discussing the art of raising capital with one of the best, Rich Dad advisor, Darren Weeks. Darren Weeks was an ordinary guy with a passion for investing. As a teenager, he began investing in penny stocks and mutual funds. He bought his first rental property as a student at the University of Alberta. But somewhere along the line, Darren started to blend in with the pack and go with the flow. For several years, he did what everyone else was doing, working a 9-to-5 to make ends meet and looking forward to the weekends. He worked in accounting and sales roles for a variety of organizations and never felt like he was getting the most out of life. Everything changed in 2001 when a friend recommended Darren read a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. The book so perfectly articulated all of his beliefs about money and reignited the passion for investing he had in his youth. Shortly after reading the book, he made the life-altering decision to start Fast Track to Cash Flow, a company that would teach Canadians the principles laid out in the book in addition to the lessons Darren had learned about money over the years. And the best part of all, Fast Track seminars would be free of charge. Fast forward to present time, Darren has amassed an investment portfolio consisting of over 5,000 rental properties across North America, tens of millions of dollars in energy interests, and hundreds of acres of land. Darren is also the largest individual shareholder in the Port of Falmouth, the world's largest cruise ship terminal, which is operated by Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. Without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. All right, today I welcome on the show, Darren Weeks. Darren, thanks for joining us. Hello, I'm excited to be here, Jacob. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, absolutely. It's our pleasure. Well, Darren, can you tell the audience a little bit more about yourself and how you got started investing in real estate? Well, you know, when I was six years old, I remember specifically where I was and what happened. I decided I wanted to be rich when I was six years old. And ever since that time, I did all kinds of unique entrepreneurial things. I'm not sure why. My parents didn't really influence me on this. But uh, for instance, when I was 10 years old, I was buying mutual funds. And the goal there was to save up to buy my own car, which I did when I was 15. I bought a beautiful $500 Buick Skyhawk. And then uh, when I was probably in grade 10, I started buying silver bars. I started studying the stock charts down at the local library and started buying penny stocks. And my fourth year university, third or fourth year university, I bought my very first property actually in 1990, a two bedroom bath and a half condo, which I still own today. So that's a little history, but um, I typically grew up in a poor dad household. And I was always told by my parents and society that I really need to go to school, study hard, get good grades. Well, I went to school, I didn't study or get good grades, and I did finally get that university degree in business, but I really was disillusioned because I got terrible marks, I hated school, I had a lot of student debt, and when I got a university, Jacob, I couldn't even get a job. So it's almost like I wanted to be rich, but then when school was my focus, it's not that I didn't still do things entrepreneurial, but I I just didn't have the same ability or drive because I thought that, you know, getting this job would, would allow me to get rich, which again, it certainly didn't do. So a little of my background is is just that, but my life really changed in 2001 when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And after that point, more than anything, it taught me that really it's okay to learn. And I hadn't probably read a book for 10 years after I graduated from school because I really hated learning because I didn't want to learn about calculus and statistics and things didn't make me money. So when I finally met Robert and heard him live, that's, again, where things change dramatically in my life. So generally speaking, that's my background, you know, not unlike many of your listeners probably as well. I just became a, a lifelong learner after meeting Robert. And more importantly, I would just implement things that he taught me. And not everything, but just the odd thing that I would learn from him in, in person or reading, I would then do. And it seemed like every time I did that, you know, I started to become a little wealthier. And that's really how I got started. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, Darren, that purple book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, has had an impact on so many people's lives and especially real estate investors. Everybody almost kind of credits their aha moment to picking up that book. And certainly I do, too. So it sounds kind of like you'd taken more of a traditional path. You had a younger entrepreneurial mindset growing up, but kind of went to university, got a degree, kind of got the corporate job and then realized that wasn't for you. So, Darren, what did that transition from kind of that mental switch of going to be an employer to being a business owner, as Robert Kiyosaki puts it, or an investor even better. What did that kind of transition look like for you? Well, it was scary because when I quit my government job that I finally got after university, I remember my dad just shaking his head and turning around and walking away from (laughs) me. He said to me, I can't believe you quit a perfectly good job because I didn't want to make $50,000 a year when my boss, who was going to retire in 15 years, and maybe I'd get his job. I just couldn't fathom that. I couldn't fathom not taking more holidays and driving nice cars and things I always wanted. So it was scary though. So I went from you know a salary to my own business. And at that time, because I was an accountant by trade and training in school, I didn't know how to sell anything. So my first business, I did it for two years. And I thought to myself, well, you know, how hard can it really be to replace my income of $25,000 back then? And uh, it was harder than I thought because I didn't know how to sell. So basically, you know, started my own business, made some mistakes, failed. Then again, you know, when I met Robert, you know, a number of years after this first business, I realized all these things were just, it's just the progression. It's normal to feel scared. It's normal to feel scared and fearful because I, like most people, were addicted to the paycheck. We're addicted to money. So it is scary. There's no doubt about it. And if I had to do it over again, I probably would have kept my job longer and did it part time for all my business versus just quitting. So for everybody listening, there's definitely some fear there. And I always suggest to people do it part time, get your feet underneath you a bit, make some mistakes and start making some income before you take the plunge finally to quit a job, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Really good advice, Darren. Well, Darren, what are you focusing on these days? That is, what kind of real estate do you own? What's your niche in real estate investing? Well, you know, that's the funny thing. I own a number of companies. And one of the companies I own is a wine company. And I don't even drink. But I own this wine company because the product was phenomenal. My partners are great. And one of the employees, like about six months ago, he he looked at me and says, so where are you investing now in real estate? And I said, you know what? I'm not investing in real estate. I hate real estate. So I'm not sure if you still want me on your show, Jacob, but I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, we'll let it, you stay. Okay, I don't like it. I like the cash flow from it. But the properties I bought, again, the first one, 1990, then a couple of years later, I bought two more and then four more. And I had about a dozen properties when I read Rich Dad Poor Dad in 2001. But I was a terrible landlord. I'm not a handyman. So I like real estate because I own and control it. But I really don't like dealing with the tenants. I don't like looking at properties. I don't like trying to fix them up. What I like to do is own them. And really what I like to do is just be basically the person who raises money for the properties. So, you know, the number may shock people. I own 5,000 properties. And that sounds crazy. But truthfully, I own about 20% of that. Because I put all the deals together, finding investors and then people like Ken Malkoroy, a rich advisor, I put these people together and my fee basically, to make a long story short, is about 20%. So most of the properties I own, I've never seen. I barely know the names of them. All I know is I get a check every month with good cash flow. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, I think it's kind of speaks to you valuing your time, Darren. It's not something that you like to do by operating and and analyzing all this property, but it sounds like you've really carved out a niche of raising money. So how did you kind of get that sales experience and how did you come across this experience that you've built up over the years? Well, you know, actually, very good question. It's a very good question. Before I ever read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, a friend of mine took a sales course, and I'll give them a plug. It's out of the United States. It's a franchise. It's called Sandler Sales. If you want to Google that, you can find out more information. But the course was $1,800. And again, my mindset back then was way different than after I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So my friends tell me how good this course is. And I thought to myself, well, my first business kind of collapsed because I didn't know how to sell. So maybe I should look into this because this guy's like telling me it's a really, really good course. But it was $1,800. bucks, and I thought to myself, that's a lot of money, you know, and I didn't have somebody else paying for it. So I said, okay, I'm going to finally take that course. And that course is what really taught me how to sell. Because again, I was an accountant by trade. I was not a born again sales, a natural born salesperson. So I took that course. And then just by learning and trying things, different businesses, I became better at sales. And what I eventually realized was very few people are good at sales, or even more so, very few people are good at building teams of salespeople. So I built a team of about 50 salespeople, and they were the ones that raised hundreds of millions of dollars for me 
basically at seminars and trade shows and, and networking events. So that's basically how I did it was I started this company to raise capital and it was a, really it's a sales company. And I basically put the deals together because people like Ken McElroy or the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line, we've also raised money for them. Everybody's looking for money. And what people have told me is that's basically a very important niche. It's hard to do. And it's a full-time business. So Jacob, imagine you, you know, you're looking for properties. That's hard enough. You then have to manage some, the tenants. Again, there's turnover all the time. That's hard enough. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to repair and, and maintain them and turn the suites over. That's hard. And every entrepreneur listening, maybe yourself, well, I can guarantee everybody listening, eventually you're going to run out of money. Yes. So I just looked at that niche and said, you know what? I will put all the hard work into raising capital because there's thousands and thousands of people out there for every person like you looking for real estate deals, there's thousands more out there that have no idea how to do that. And they'd rather just put their money into good deals with people like you. So I was just the middle person. And uh, Jacob, I would say to you, hey, if I can raise money for you, will you give me a piece of the deal? And I would disclose that to my investors and they'd say, okay, that's fine. It's win, win, win. Everybody wins. And I basically built a very large company that raised hundreds of millions of dollars. And I, I don't do it in that capacity anymore, but that's what I did. Yes. Yeah, so Darren, what did that look like for you when you were first starting out? Because you can't just go out to your friends and family and ask for hundreds of millions of dollars right off the bat. I'm sure you started small and scaled that by building your network and, and your circle of influence. Could you talk about what that kind of time frame looked like for you? Absolutely. That's, again, a great question. About 20, boy, I'm getting old. You know, after those first dozen properties, I ran out of money and, you know, I was very creative and I found all the different ways I could buy properties, but eventually I just ran out of money. Couldn't get any more money from my personal sources. And the banks also, especially up here in Canada, they're very restrictive. Once you have certain debt levels, they don't want to give you any more mortgages. No matter what happens, they're just going to say no. So I used to go to teacher conventions and I would go to these conventions and they're like trade shows. And there's thousands of teachers that are, you know, walking up and down these massive trade show corridors and anybody could buy a booth for, you know, three or 400 bucks and sell your wares, anybody. So I just had a booth there. It was, you know, my real estate company. And as people walked by the booth, I'd try to get them to, you know, come on into the area so we could at least strike up a conversation. And I gave them a little pitch and, you know, then I would follow up with them after that. So I started with teacher conventions and that's how I started raising money. And basically I would say to the teacher, most people want some real estate in their portfolio, and most people's paper portfolios are not doing very well, at least over the long term. And I just said, I could show you a way how to get cash flow on a monthly basis and own real estate that you own and control, and I'll show you how to do that in partnership with me. So I started doing these teacher conventions, and Jacob, I made so many mistakes, unbelievable amount of mistakes, and I did that for about a year. And maybe just a sports analogy, it was almost like, for me, that was like the minor leagues. You're not going to go, I'm a hockey fan, so you're not going to go to the National Hockey League if you don't go through the minors first. So I made all my mistakes at the teacher conventions. I got my 30-second commercial down pat. I got a company brand. I dressed for success. I bought a used Mercedes on purpose so you know people would look at me and attribute a look to somewhat success. And uh, I learned, made a lot of mistakes, and I had about maybe 20 teachers buy properties with me. And then, Jacob, guess what I did next? What's that? Well, I then said, okay, there's got to be a better way rather than selling, you know, one investment at a time, because that's all the teachers would really do is, in, you know, invest twenty five or $30,000 at a time with me. Mm -hmm. I then went to dentist conventions a year after that. <laughs> okay. And I made all my mistakes with teachers, I would say, and I made all my money with dentists. And that's where, you know, things really started to take off. I had a lot more dentists invest with me and they'd write a check for a hundred grand, no problem right off the bat. So that's how I started, uh, you know, raising capital. And I did this before I ever read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Wow. Well, so, Darren, were you having to educate these potential investors given that their profession or background wasn't in real estate investing? Are you having to go out and talk to these teachers or dentists and let them know, you yeah. know, the benefits of real estate, you know, the ways real estate pays you and, you know, all of these things? Yeah, absolutely. And that is the biggest lesson if you're listening. And, you know, two or three times a year throughout the world, I'll teach a course on the art of raising capital. I did one uh, this year in Mexico, did one in Germany. And that's really what the course is all about, is how do you educate people to change their belief systems that they should invest in real estate, number one, in state of paper assets. Number two, they should invest with entrepreneurs like you, Jacob, or myself, rather than giving their money to the banks. That's really important. So really, the two-day training is just all about changing people's mindsets so they start to realize the benefits of investing with entrepreneurs directly versus giving your money to a bank or, or Wall Street. So absolutely, I had to educate them. 
And here's what I did because I wanted to systemize my business and, and save time. So it's kind of funny, but you know, Jacob, do you mind even role playing with me a little bit? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. All right. So let's pretend you're at a teacher convention and you're walking by my booth. Now, most people at a trade show, you know that if you go near somebody's booth, they're going to try to sell you something, correct? <laughs> right. And most teachers are very cheap. So the last thing they want to do is, you know, spend any money. So they wouldn't really come near your booth unless you could entice them. So I would have, you know, a box on top of my trade show dis table display that was in gold wrapping paper and said free dinner, you know, on it. And they could enter to a draw. So they might come in and put the name in the draw. Yeah, okay. Or if, if there were a group of ladies walking by, I would purposely look at them and say, hey, ladies, would you like a kiss? And they would look at me kind of strangely. <laughs> and then I would point to my, my Hershey bowl of kisses, the candies. So they would laugh and then they'd come in and eat a candy. So at that time, I would just say, you know, for instance, Jacob, hey, thanks for stopping by. Would it be okay if I told you a little bit about what I do? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, let's do it. Good. Well, you know, I'm, my name is Darren Weeks. I'm a professional real estate investor. And my team and I, for the last number of years, have put together different opportunities for investors like you who are tired of the ups and downs of the stock market. You know, people that want cash flow that is virtually guaranteed on a monthly basis. And we show people why they should own real estate in their portfolio, but in a way that they don't have to have any effort or headaches with typical real estate investments. So, Jacob, does that interest you at all? I mean, I don't know, Darren. It, it kind of sounds nice, but it's fairly unfamiliar to me. I'm, I'm not real sure about all of that. Well, you know, Jacob, that's a very good point because it is a lot of work and it's actually to some degree, most, to some degree, it's fairly complicated for people that don't know real estate. So I'll tell you what I'll do, Jacob. If you're interested, and there is about a $25,000 minimum investment, but you actually own title to the properties that we would invest together. But rather than me trying to sell you something here today, because that's the last thing I want to do, I've got something here I can give to you. Now, Jacob, you're a pretty young guy, so I'm going to say something that's going to age myself. I created something called a cassette tape. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> yes, I've heard of it. <laughs> All right. Well, I had a cassette tape, and it was professionally done. It was actually four people. They were playing around a golf, and they were just talking back and forth about this real estate program that I produced. So I would give the tape to people like you. So I say, Jacob, you know, it's kind of like a, a jigsaw puzzle. There's lots of different pieces and they've all got to go in a certain order. And it takes at least an hour for me to give people the information. And obviously, Jacob, you're not going to make a decision today to invest with me. And if you're married or have somebody else that may want to influence this decision, there's no point in getting into too many of the details. Plus, I'm very busy. There's hundreds of people that come and talk to me at these shows. So if I give you this cassette tape, would it be okay if I called you in a week and we could maybe discuss if you're interested? And if you're not, Jacob, that's okay too. Like, don't ever feel like I'm going to pressure you. If you ever want to say no, no problem. So would you like this cassette tape? Hey, yeah, I, I'll go ahead and take it. Okay. Now, Jacob, of course, I'm going to call you. And I know, you know, there's a lot of people that are really polite and they want to take the tape. But the last thing I want you to do is take it and feel obliged and you're never going to listen to it. So if you want it, I do need your phone number and I will call you in a week. So I'm going to say one more time because this is my philosophy. In fact, I took accounting in school. I didn't take a sales course. So I'm not a professional salesperson. I'm a professional real estate investor. If you want to say no now or at any time, you're not going to hurt my feelings. So if I give you this tape, I do need your information. I'll call you in a week. Do you still want to move forward? Yeah, it sounds interesting to me. I'll, I'd be glad to give you my number. Okay. So Jacob, what did you kind of get out of that, you know, little role playing activity? And again, you and I have never done this before. We started talking, yeah, right. you know, 20 minutes. What went through your mind? Well, I, I didn't feel very pressured, Darren. I felt like you were just trying to give me information and not make me, you know, like pull out my wallet and write you a check today. So, okay. So that is the number one key for everybody listening. People are only going to invest with you if they like you and trust you. So I'm telling you right now, 90% of it is you, not the house or the duplex or the apartment building you're trying to sell the person. It's you. So that's my personality. First of all, I don't want to pressure anybody anyway. I don't want to have somebody invest with me if they're not comfortable. So like and trust is the key. So I would just get people to like and trust me at the trade show so they would accept my call. Then we'd set up the next meeting, which would be with, you know, the spouse probably. And the next time I'd call them, maybe it was a chicken dinner, a free chicken dinner with 10 people, which I used to host. I'd invite them to that. And it was just getting to know them and building a relationship because the process would take six months before they invest with you. Now, that process was collapsed a lot once I understood you know, how this game worked. And people would literally invest with my company within a week from when they met us. But that's how I started. Just simply, that's how I started. And I just practiced hundreds of times with people, made lots of mistakes. And you know what? One out of 100 would say yes. And then two out of 100 say yes. And then probably 20 out of 100 would say yes. But remember, you're still going to get way more people say no than you're ever going to get to say yes.
Yeah, right. Well, Darren, at this time when you're doing these types of activities, when you're going out to these conferences and kind of pitching, you know, potential investors, did you have an investor that you were working with on the back end of putting these investors in deals or was that you as well? It was pretty much me back then. And then one of my mentors, his name is John Murphy. He started buying apartment buildings and he asked me to partake in a small way. And I, I kind of got cut into the action, let's say. And that's really where I learned a lot was how to syndicate these apartment buildings. So you buy 150 or a 200 unit building for, you know, back then, say 50,000 a door, renovate it for 10 to 60 and sell it for, you know, 75 or something like that. And that's basically how I really got started buying real estate yeah. and raising money. Okay. Well, Darren, you've since gone on to uh, you know use real estate to buy all kinds of different businesses. You've got lots of different things going on. Could you talk about what some of your different businesses look like today? Well, I mentioned the one. It's a wine company called Celestial Wine and Spirits. It's a wine company with some wine that comes from Moldova. My partners are from Moldova, so that's why they brought the wine to Canada. And I didn't get involved because I'm a wine connoisseur. In fact, I've never tasted the wine. You know, a lot of it's won many awards. But what I saw was a great product and what I could bring to the table, and this is my specialty, is hiring salespeople. And if there's every, you know, another tip, if you have a business, if you hire somebody full time and you have a good product and they're knocking on doors and explaining who you are and your brand and your product, you're going to have some success. So we've grown that dramatically over the last couple of years. And then uh, more recently, I've also brought to Canada something called Black Rifle Coffee. So I'm the uh, owner up here in Canada. Of course, it's owned by Evan and a group of uh, individuals down in the States, but I own the Canada sort of Canada company. And that's also very exciting and growing very, very quickly. Yeah, that's actually a company I'm familiar with, Darren. We see a lot of the uh, advertisement here in the States for Black Rifle Coffee. I'm, I'm an avid coffee drinker myself, so maybe it's just uh, my bias. But how does that relationship work? It seems that you just bought the Canada operations of that company. Is that right? Well, I won't get into too many specific details on how that was structured, but basically because of somebody's track record, eventually once you get some experience, there's more and more opportunities that present themselves. So I simply was in the States in San Antonio, actually Bandera, Texas, and I was drinking Black Rifle and I thought, okay, this is good coffee because I, I really appreciate good coffee. And then the person who was serving it one day served me a different coffee and I could taste the difference immediately. And I said, what happened to good coffee? And they kind of laughed and said, well, Black Rifle's out of stock. And they told me why, you know, they're growing so quickly. So I said, who's distributing that in Canada? And uh, my friend Josh and Lisa Lana, the British advisors, they put me in touch with some of the owners. Next thing you know, it's, I've got Canada up and running here. So it's just because of asking questions. You know, unfortunately, a lot of American companies kind of forget about Canada. So I've asked that question many times and had some really good results by saying, hey, let me represent your brand in Canada. And many, many times companies say, yeah, please do, because we don't have a presence there. So that's kind of how it started. And again, it's because of my track record. You know, I have built sales teams and I've got some background in, in success in, in building companies. So that's probably why they said, okay, let's, let's make sure this is uh, something we do in Canada with Darren. Yeah, okay. So, so far you've got a wine company, a coffee company. What else is there, Darren? Well, you know, I took a personal development course and it's called the Hoffman Institute. And I took that actually two years ago on December 2015. And it was a week-long course, and I won't get into the details, but it was a personal development course. And, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, myself, and all the advisors were continuously meeting and going to different personal development courses. So this is one that I went to, and I liked it so much that I bought the company in Canada. So Hoffman uh, Canada, basically, is what I also own with my wife. And then we've got a few other businesses. But as you can probably tell, I didn't say that I'm buying real estate. So again, my belief is businesses create a lot of cash flow, and I love love to build sales teams and I can sell businesses for good multiples. So I then take that money and put it into real estate. So that, those are some of the businesses I'm operating now. And um, one of the goals I have is actually to have five businesses that do over a million dollars each in sales. And of those five, one is going to be over 25 million in sales and one's going to be over 5 million. You know, Jacob, the reason those are important to me is very few companies actually even do a million dollars in sales. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you a question. And in Canada, there's almost 2 million businesses. So in the States, I'm assuming there's at least 20 million businesses. What percent of businesses do you think do over $1 million in sales in a year? What percentage? Um, I'm going to guess, Darren, that maybe 5% of businesses do over $1 million in sales in the States. Yeah. And I think it's pretty much a worldwide statistic, but it's close to 4%. So you're very close. Wow, okay. Very few people get that number. So when you think about a million dollars, that's in sales. That doesn't mean, you know, the person's a millionaire. That just means in sales. Right. So 
Only 4%. So my goal is to have five companies that do that and I'm well on my way. And again, one has to be over 25 million sales. And that's, that's kind of my new goal. I sold my seminar company and I, I don't speak as much as I used to. I used to host hundreds of events every year. And I'm just, I've kind of, you know, reached my pinnacle in the seminar business in my mind. I just want to move on to, to try new things. Yeah, awesome. So Darren, you've started out by raising capital for real estate, putting potential investors into real estate deals. You've since taken that skill and translated it into different types of companies from growing wine and coffee companies. And now what about what's your interest in the cruise line terminals that you have? Because that's another very interesting business venture, it seems. The interesting part about the cruise companies, the cruise line basically investments was I raised money and we built a cruise ship terminal in Trujillo, Honduras. And uh, we built it. We have cruise ships that now go there. And it was a private um, cruise ship terminal. And I don't know the cruise ship world that much, but it could be the only private one in the world. So Randy Jorgensen is my partner down there. And after we did that one, when the financial crisis hit back in 2009 or so, the banks just stopped lending money. So we were approached by the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line Company. And that's a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah. You know, some of their executives up to Edmonton, they watched how we, we raised money. They came to some of our events and we raised, I think, I think it was 11 million U.S. dollars. And we purchased with them the cruise ship terminal in Falmouth, Jamaica. And cruise ships, when they dock, that real estate they dock at is some of the most expensive real estate in the world because you've got all these tourists that get off the ship and want to spend money. So the point is, when you're good at raising capital, you know, again, we're just some small little company up in Canada. And all of a sudden, the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line's up here doing their due diligence on us. So imagine the due diligence they would have done on us to say, yeah, let's do business together. So that's kind of one of my favorite deals in a lot of ways because the size of the our Royal Caribbean Cruise Line company coming to us to say, hey, let's do some business together. So that's what I did with the, the two cruise ships terminals is I raised money to build them. Yeah, well, Darren, that's awesome. It's really a testament to your ability to raise money, having someone like Royal Caribbean coming up there and, you know, like you said, vetting you and your company and almost learning from you. So really awesome mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, that was. It was, uh, it was fun times and uh, life was good. I'm happy. Well, Darren, what are some of your current projects these days? That is, what are you working on? Well, the last couple of months, Black Rifle has been very busy, but I have traveled quite a bit. I was in Argentina and Paraguay with Robert and a couple of the advisors speaking, and I spoke in Germany as well. And uh, next month, December 9th and 10th in Mexico City, Puebla specifically, just outside Mexico City, I'm going to host the world's largest cash flow game ever. And really, I think this is kind of a thank you to Robert Kiyosaki. I started hosting cash flow games back in 2001. My first game, Jacob, I only had four people show up. And eventually I had 800 people play the game at once, and that was in Toronto. And that's the record as it stands today. We had 800 people. So in Puebla, we're going to set this world record. Robert's going to be there live. He wanted to support the event. So that's what I'm working on is making sure that we smash the world record cash flow event and have about 3,000 people play that game at one time, as well as we're going to do a live streaming event. Sorry, people in Peru are also going to partake in that event. So we're going to have probably 4,000 people play the game at one time. Yeah, awesome, Darren. Really cool. Well, uh, breaking your own record and uh, going on to do those things. So fun. I'm sure that'll be an exciting event. It should be fun. Hopefully you can maybe come down to Mexico and partake in it, Jacob. Yeah, definitely yeah. so. Well, Darren, let's kind of get back to talking about raising capital. And when you're sure. talking about raising capital to new investors, what are some things that they could do to start expanding their network and laying the groundwork for being able to raise capital on a large scale like you do? Well, you know, again, it starts with, you know, doing the little things and almost forcing yourself to do things. So, for instance, let's say you went to a teacher convention and you spent 300 bucks or 400 bucks and you said, OK, now I'm going to tell people I'm a real estate investor. Well, now you're forced to make sure you have, a, you know, a quality business card. You know, a trade show booth's got to be looking decent. You now have to have a website, obviously, that explains who you are. So that's the first step is putting yourself out there. And it's almost like, you know, I don't know the story or the fable, but it's like burning the boat. You know, like the minute you register for that, okay, now you've got to do it. So it kind of forces you to get ready early. And just start networking. You know, the cash flow game is an amazing tool that I've played with. I've probably played that cash flow game with more people than anybody else in the world. And a lot of my investors came from that game because it changes their mindset and they want to do something different. And if you can give them a solution, they may want to invest with you. So host games, you know, go to conventions, go to networking events. Jacob, have you ever heard of BNI? No, I have not. It's called Business Networking International. And I brought that to Edmonton probably 20 years ago. I'm not, a, I'm not involved anymore. I haven't been for 15 years. 
it's a great place to network with people. So there's all kinds of ways you should network. And I would make sure, though, if you're going to have a network, make sure you have, you know, some kind of a web page or something so people can connect with you and uh, just start asking for money. And again, Jacob, I'm going to ask you something else. And I want everybody to ask this question honestly to themselves. Jacob, you, you know, you told me you're obviously you're buying properties on your own. And if you haven't yet, I don't, I don't want to get too personal. You're probably going to run out of money eventually. Fair to say? Yes, definitely so. So in the last 30 days, Jacob, how many people have you asked to invest with you? You know, I've definitely laid some groundwork, Darren, and I wouldn't say directly asked, but started, you know, telling others what I've been doing, personal friends of mine, I would say maybe 10 people. Okay, but not directly asked anybody, correct? Correct. So that's the key is the reason people don't raise money is they don't ever ask anybody. And I realize you have to lay the groundwork and you have to have a track record. Okay, got all that. But you have a track record, right, Jacob? Yes, I do. And you have some deals that are producing good returns? Yes. Yeah. And imagine if your friends would have invested in them, would they have been probably happy with the return so far? Oh, much better than what they're doing now. <laughs> so that's my question to everybody. And mostly it's a belief system. You know, why don't you try to help out your fellow friends, family, potential investors? I'm not saying you should invest with you just because. I'm saying you should invest with them because you're going to help them with better returns. Or you're going to help them with some true diversification. So the question I really have for everybody is the so-called young investors or, or whatever, how many people have you asked to invest with you? If the answer is zero, then you need to change that. Start asking people to invest with you. Yeah, yeah, very true, Darren. I think it's great advice. You've got to be more direct, be more uh, you know, out with it. But again, you always have to think, I want to help them. So my mission was to have clean, affordable housing. So I'd always have good tenants and to give above average returns to my investors. If I did those two things, then I would also get rewarded. But if I didn't do those two things, I wouldn't be rewarded. So you always want to do it with obviously their best interests at heart. Because if you're going to raise other people's money, it's a huge responsibility. I didn't raise money to, you know, to take salaries or you know, travel the world. I raised money to put into deals. And I realized that investors... If they're going to give me the money, it's their blood, sweat, and tears that went into getting that money. So you have to take it very serious. But what I'm really suggesting is if you can truly look them in the eyes and give them better returns, I think you're doing people in your circle of influence a disservice by not asking them. Yeah. Well, Darren, that brings up a good point. What do above average returns mean to you and your investors? Well, that's actually a really good question. So here, here's another tip, and this could literally save you millions of dollars in your career. I never, ever say a specific number because everybody has different numbers. Make them happy. But I will say this, at every teacher convention and at every dentist convention, when I ask people what kind of returns would they be happy with to see if we should even meet or not, never once in my history did I have anybody say more than 10%. Never. So, Jacob, if you were interested in investing with me, I wouldn't give you a number right off the top of my head. I would sit down with you and ask you a lot of questions and ask you questions about your history, what your goals are, what kind of returns you've received, what kind of returns you'd want. Because if you say to me, I'd be thrilled with anything over four because all my money is in the savings right now, then I'd probably arrange a deal where I could make you five or six. Yeah, right. Okay. So I wouldn't say I'm going to make you 12 or 15 if you're happy with four. Does that make sense? Right. So again, most people have a very small context when it comes to returns and anything over 10, they really don't even believe it's true. They think it's too risky if you say anything too high anyway, even if you're getting it. So I would just sit down with people, ask them their returns they would want to get. And if somebody had a decent return that I could quite easily achieve for them, then I'd say, okay, I think I can help you, Jacob. If I ever get a deal that, that makes sense on these numbers, then I'll, I'll phone you and I'll, I'll show you how we can make that work. Yeah. Okay. So it's really, uh, you know, kind of making the deal work around the investor and doing what makes them happy. Yes. Now I've had a lot of people that come to my course and they say, well, you know, I give half the profits to my investors. And I just ask the question, okay, why? You know, if you get into a really good market, you can make 50, 80, 100% returns. So why do you want to give away half of it when the investor would be happy with four, six, 8%? Right. Right. So that's why I say this tip alone could save you a lot of money if you're listening. Yeah, definitely. So, and I see what you're talking about there, Darren. Somebody says, hey, I want 7%. And if I give it to him, but I make 40, I don't feel bad. He wanted seven. I, you know, I gave him seven or eight or nine. I don't feel bad. That's what he wanted. Yeah, yeah, very true. Well, Darren, what other advice would you have to someone out there looking to get started raising money for particularly real estate investments? Well, you do have to have some experience. I mean, outside of maybe your parents or, or whatnot, I don't think somebody's going to give you money without experience. So the key is to get experience. And I think working for free is really important. In fact, today I had a Rich Dad radio show with Robert Kiyosaki. And we talked about, you know, the more you give, the more you shall receive. So if you don't have experience, you really need to get some. 
So, you know, Jacob, as an example, has some properties. And if you don't have any experience, maybe work for free for somebody like Jacob or somebody in your neighborhood or city, sorry, that has 10 or 15 properties. And you may say, you know what, Jacob, I'd love to learn from you, but I don't want to take. I really want to just serve you with no expectations in return. So I've got 10 hours a week or 20 hours a month. And I'd be more than happy to do some small maintenance handyman stuff or find tenants for you or paint properties or, you know, whatever it takes just to be in the environment and to learn from you. Now, Jacob, has anybody ever asked you to work for free for you? Definitely not. (laughs) What if somebody did? Like, what would go through your mind if somebody literally said, hey, I'd love to just learn from you and work for free for 10 hours a week? Oh, well, one, I'd be pretty excited, Darren. I would think that, hey, this sounds like a really good deal. I'd be happy to talk real estate with you. Obviously, I like talking real estate. That's why I have this podcast. So, hey, if you wanted to come and work with me or for me and just to be in the environment, yeah, I'd say by all means, let's do it. Okay, so let's just say that I worked for free for you for six months, Jacob. But then I said, okay, in the seventh month, you know, Jacob, I've never asked you for anything because that's the point. You're just going to work for free and serve. But, you know, I'd really like to earn, you know, maybe some equity. So could I work a little bit more and maybe the next deal I have a little sweat equity and I own 5% of the deal? I think that sounds really fair. So now you own 5% of a deal and now you can say to people, yeah, I own a property because you literally do. And in fact, I've worked with a real estate entrepreneur who has, you know, a number of years experience, has over 25 properties, and I now can show people how to get better returns than they can get in the banks. So now you've got experience is my point. You've got a story and you have real experience. And now you can talk the language of real estate with potential investors. So getting experience is the key, in my opinion. If you don't have any, make sure you work for free, take some courses at the same time and get some education. Yeah, really good actionable advice there, Darren. Good stuff. Well, Darren, as we're wrapping up here, can you tell us a little bit about how you've built your team? I know you've done a lot of deals and have a lot of different business adventures, and I'm sure you haven't got there on your own. So could you talk about what your team looks like and how you've built that up? Well, you know, years ago when I was doing seminars, 90% of my employees would really come to an event that I would host. My events used to be free. The vast majority of them are free. And we talked about that concept I just mentioned, you know, working for free, making sure that you work for your mission first before you. And I would just have literally people want to work with my company just because they are part of that event. So that was one of the main reasons we were one of the fastest growing companies in Canada for a number of years. Is just great people wanted to work for us because they loved our mission of financial education. So I've kind of taken those lessons. And now when I interview people, again, I've got a little more experience. I always want to make sure that people are looking for the mission first the team second, and then their third. You know, when people come into my company now for an interview and it's all about how many holidays do I get? What kind of pay do I get? Are there health benefits? That doesn't excite me. When they talk about the mission of Black Rifle Coffee, for instance, of, you know, supporting veterans and and causes that help veterans out, being part of a team that's a winning team that has fun at work, that's what I'm excited about. Not people saying, again, how much do I get paid and when do I get, you know, more holidays and and all that jazz. So the key is to find people that really are mission driven and want to support your mission and not just make money for a paycheck. Yeah. Okay. Really good. I like it. Good stuff. Well, Darren, what are your future goals with all of your business ventures? Well, you know, again, I I try not to work too hard. Last, uh, well, actually this year uh, for about seven weeks, my family, we were down in Cabo San Lucas. So I, I definitely want to have the ability to travel the world. And as I look at my office right now, Jacob, You'll never believe this, but there's like three feet of snow because I'm in Edmonton. It's cold right now. So, you know, some of my goals are to have, you know, these companies are growing and have a team here in my office in Edmonton that allows them to grow without me being here and to, you know, enjoy the life most people would love to have, which is just the choice to do whatever you want when you want. I get excited about new projects and I work really hard and build teams up, but I still want to make sure I have lots of time for my family and, and my wife and travel the world as well. Yeah, awesome. I think that's really important, Darren. Well, Darren, as we're wrapping up here, we've got a lightning round. Just a series of questions we'd like to fire at you, and you just answer from the hip. How does that sound? Oof, I'm getting a little nervous now. <laughs> I'm sure you can handle it. So I'll try my best. Okay. Well, Darren, what was your biggest hurdle getting started investing in real estate, and how'd you overcome it? The biggest hurdle was, again, money. You know, my first property I bought one as a university student, so I didn't know how to get financing. So it's kind of funny, but I haven't been asked this question or thought of this for a long time, but every time I would go to a bank, whether I was buying you know, stocks or trying to look at student loans, how that worked, every banker I talked to, I always say, how do I go about buying real estate? And Jacob, let's say I asked 10 different bankers the exact same question. Guess how many answers I got? I'm sure 10. 
Exactly. And that was <laughs> what was really key for me was really just starting to understand the rules. So that was the biggest hurdle to start with. It was just understanding all the ins and outs and how to be creative. So creativity is a very, very important word. So I was very creative and that allowed me to buy about a dozen properties for almost no money out of my pocket. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, Darren, do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success? I probably don't have one that I I'm disciplined enough to do on a regular basis. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, I have the Hoffman company and they, they teach me a lot of skills. The reason I bought the company was it was like no other seminar I went to. And it allowed me to actually take skills out of that seminar that I can work on a daily basis. So it's very complex as far as what I could share with you right now. But basically the Hoffman Institute in Canada and Hoffman Worldwide, it gives you tools that you can replicate every day. And one of those things is just looking at um, what I'm grateful for every day on a daily basis. So that's one of the things I look at is just so many things have been in my life that I'm grateful for. So I try to reflect on those every morning. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, Darren, do you have an online resource you find valuable? Well, you know what? I'm going to actually say that, I mean, there's many, many, you know, online resources. Uh, Rich Dad Radio is obviously very good, but also Vern Harnish. He's a gentleman who created a company called The Gazelles gazelles.com i believe Vern harnish and he wrote a book years ago that i studied and it was called mastering the rockefeller habits so he has an email that comes out i think every week and it's the one email or e-sign whatever you want to call it it's the one that i never miss i read it all the time and he's got great great resources awesome okay well darren what book would you recommend to the listeners and why well if this is you know real estate related obviously ken McElroy has three books on real estate so the abc's real estate investing would probably be the first one and then after that, though, the book I just mentioned, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits, has now been upgraded. It's called Scaling Up. So it's Mastering the Rockefeller Habits 2.0. It's called Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. And my executive team, we studied and implemented that book, and that's what allowed us to be one of the fastest growing companies in Canada. So that would be and is one of my favorite books. It's a how-to book. You know, a lot of Robert's books are context, context-based, think a little bit bigger, not necessarily how to do things. Whereas this book, Scaling Up, it's specific step-by-step-by-step how to build your business. And I want to remind everybody, if you're in real estate, it's still a business. So that's my favorite book. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, that's Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. Yes, sir. And we'll link that in the show notes. Okay. And Darren, last question. If you were to give advice to your 20-year-old self to get started investing in real estate, what would it be? I think education. I took a Bachelor of Commerce degree and besides putting me in debt and causing me a lot of stress. <laughs> so go take some courses. And, you know, the one thing I would say with that is just make sure that you involve, sorry, you register in courses that have money back guarantees. Every one of my seminars, I always said to people, if you want your money back, if you're not happy, go ahead, I'll give you your money back. And in 17 years, they had one person ever ask for the money back. So take courses and make sure you get good value with those courses. And we really have to change our mindset around education. You know, just because a university doesn't give you the course doesn't mean it's not going to be very valuable. So take some educational courses. And that's what Robert Kiyosaki talks about and teaches is financial education. And uh, this is an example. But I mean, if you're already listening to this podcast, Jacob's done a great job putting together some great experts. And it's education. So continue down the education path. And I'm now a lifelong learner. Yeah, awesome. I think that's important, Darren. Always learning, never being stagnant, always growing and, uh, you know, just adding stuff to your tool belt, I think is the most important thing you could do. Yeah, definitely. Well, Darren, you're certainly an expert around raising capital. In fact, you have a book called The Art of Raising Capital. Could you tell us a little bit about that book? Well, actually, Robert asked me to write that book because he said the number one skill of an entrepreneur is the skill of raising capital. I mean, everybody listening, guaranteed you've been turned down by a bank or they, you haven't asked for any money from a bank, one or the other. Or, you know, the banks, they want your house as a, as a personal guarantee. It makes it just really difficult to be able to raise money as an entrepreneur if you just use the banks. So basically, Robert, you know, he believes in good debt. And besides raising a few hundred million dollars, I've also got hundreds of millions of dollars of debt behind me as well, which is paid off by my tenants. So the book really just tells a story on what you need to do step by step by step if you want to raise capital. Today, I touched on a few tips, obviously, that are included in the book, but it really is a how-to guide on how to you know, raise capital so you never run out of money again and you never say no to a project that is it's a good project. Yeah, awesome. Well, I think that's really important, Darren, and I'm sure our audience could all get a ton of value from reading that book. So we'll certainly link that book in the show notes as well. Okay, I appreciate it. I really do. And, uh, you know, I just appreciate uh, you interviewing me and asking me some questions. And if I can help anybody out there listening, get their first property or raise a little money, it's it's really my mission on, on this earth. That's what I like to do. I like to help people. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that, Darren. 
Darren, if our audience would like to learn more about you or connect with you, where can they find you? Well, you know, I'm not a big social media guy. Um, DarrenWeeks.com, when I sold my seminar company, I kind of let that website go, but I'm redoing it. So if you go there now, there is something there, but it's going to be redone in the next month. So DarrenWeeks.com would probably be the best place. But again, I'm really not in the public eye as much as I used to be, but that would be uh, probably the one website you could find me at. And check out Black Rifle Coffee as well. Okay, great. Well, Darren, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Take action, everybody. Thank you, Darren. Take care. Thanks. All right, that wraps up our episode today with Rich Dad Advisor, Darren Weeks. As a Rich Dad Advisor to Robert Kiyosaki, Darren knows a thing or two about how to be a successful real estate investor. Darren brought up a good point on today's show, and that is, no matter what, at some point, you will personally run out of your own money to invest in deals. Knowing that, you have two options. You can either learn how to raise capital from other investors or slow your acquisition of your own personal properties. It's up to you which route you take, but if you choose to raise money from investors, Darren is one of the best in the business, and I highly recommend checking him out for more information and tips on how to do so. That wraps up this week's episode. I hope you're getting value from this show. If you've liked what you've heard, please leave a rating and review on whichever platform you're listening on. As always, if you have any questions or comments or want to hear something or someone specific on this show, just reach out to me. You can contact me at www.jacobairs.com forward slash contact or connect with me on Facebook at The Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom. Till next week, signing off, I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.